Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Catrice Lee, and I'm here representing the Jacobs School of Engineering at UC San Diego. We're glad to have you all with us for our event, Energy in 2020, Opportunities in the Green Industrial Revolution. So we're brought here today by a unique partnership between SDG&E, the Jacobs School of Engineering, and the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. This opportunity came about because of uh, SDG&E's belief that we could all be doing better than what we are, and they have imagined a green future. So SDG&E, specifically the Workforce Training and Education Group, challenged the San Diego community to conceptualize what we mean when we think of a green future. UCSD took this challenge and partnered with the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce to develop the speaking series for which you are here for today. We, uh, we envision energy in 2020 as being everyone's responsibility. Uh, UCSD, as an educational institution, sees our job as training our students for the future that they will be graduating into uh, at the completion of their education. And as we know, the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce is a representative here in San Diego locally, as well as across the country on issues that affect businesses as they consider their more sustainable practices. And so we have uh, representatives here who will tell you much more about the Green Chamber uh, when they come up. So you might ask, why UCSD? And what makes us a sustainable place? And what makes us feel like we have the authority to be in this space talking to you this evening? So the College Sustainability Report in 2011 gave UCSD the grade of A- minus in terms of being a sustainable campus. And so what I've put on the screen are just some of their comments in their report on UCSD. So one of them here, solar, panel, solar panels generate 3% of the campus's energy, and UCSD purchases 20% of its energy from renewable sources. So as you guys were traveling to campus today, or if you've been to campus before, you may have noticed that we have solar trees over several of our parking lots. Many of our buildings have uh, solar panels on top of them. And they're here not only as part of uh, the energy capture for campus, but we're a living laboratory. And so we have countless professors and student groups who are also working towards a better understanding of solar energy and what it means for our future. Uh, all, all new construction and renovations must meet LEED Silver standards. This is something we take great pride in. Uh, here on this side of campus, uh, there are green housing complexes. In the engineering school, we've just opened a new building, which you'll hear more about later, that is in the process of receiving gold certification. And so it's something we take very seriously in renovation and new construction. The university reduced greenhouse emissions 6% from 2006 to 2008 and aims to be carbon neutral by 2025. And so this is very much in line with SDG&E's goals for the San Diego area in terms of electricity usage. And it's something where we feel we can be a leader in San Diego area. And then to the last one there, more than 30% of the campus fleet is electric and UCSD also runs 42 ultra low sulfur biodiesel shuttle buses. And if, you're ever, if you've ever been in this area at any time of the day where there are students present, you know how meaningful this is in terms of the number of students who are moving onto and off of campus at all times of the day to have these energy efficient vehicles doing the moving for us. So just a few short notes on the Jacobs School of Engineering as one of your hosts for this evening. Our vision in the Jacobs School is for the Jacobs School to provide the human capital and the intellectual capital to drive our innovation society. And you know, we can think about innovation tonight in particular in terms of our sustainability initiatives. The mission of our school is to educate tomorrow's technology leaders, conduct leading edge research and drive innovation, and transfer discoveries for the benefit of society. We actually have the largest engineering school in the state of California with 192 faculty members and nearly 7,000 undergraduate and graduate students. I see several people saying, wow, you know, it's, it's something that you don't know if you, you know, frequently aren't, aren't frequently here on campus, but uh, we have six departments that are housing and educating and graduating all of these students. And our departments themselves are standout among engineering schools across the country. We have mechanical and aerospace engineering, structural engineering, electrical uh, engineering, computer science engineering, bioengineering, and our newest department is nanoengineering. 
as the first, one of the first departments in the country to offer both undergraduate, graduate, and research opportunities in nanoengineering. As a school, we have a strategic focus for on a strategic research focus on energy, environment, and sustainability, and that's where we see ourselves as one of the leaders. And our school actually is leading campus-wide and advanced energy initiative, and this will be a part. Oh, like this is slide there. Sorry, uh, the advanced energy initiative, which uh, will be a part of UC San Diego's campus-wide campaign in the very near future, where we're developing technologies that help meet the energy needs of all humanity in a clean and sustainable manner. And so I know it's a mouthful and it's very theoretical, uh, but for example, one of our faculty members in engineering, Jan Kleisel, is doing solar power generation forecasting, where he has uh, developed a physical device as well as computer, computer algorithms that predict cloud patterns to optimize the capture of solar energy as well as the storage and uh, the use of it. And so not only doing the solar, but taking it a step further and saying even in our sunny Southern California, what can we do to capture it more efficiently and move our practices even further into the future? And so like I said, it's, that's one of many projects that you'll be able to see coming from campus in the very near future as part of this initiative. So right now, I'd like to bring up David Steele, a representative from the U.S. Green Chamber. He's the CEO, and he'll tell you more about the Green Chamber, its initiatives, as well as introducing our keynote speaker for this evening. David? Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out tonight. I know we'd all probably like to be home watching the election coverage because it's so exciting. But, uh, but thank, thank you for coming. And, uh, I can't tell you how wonderful it was. I was telling my staff when I woke up today because of working with Catrice and UCSD to have an event and just have every aspect handled and taken care of and, and done. It's just, it's so, so nice. So I'm looking forward to, um, to working with UCSD uh, quite a bit more in the future. Um, and while I'm talking about the future and UCSD, we are gonna have another event um, with UCSD next month on the 14th, on a Wednesday. So we'll be sending out details of that event and the exact location and topic and all of that. Um, I know it's kind of quick, but we're trying to get everything in before uh, the end of the year and competing with uh, holiday schedules and things that, like that. Um, but let me just take a couple minutes and uh, tell you about the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. Um, I have a real exciting announcement that I'll tell you about in a moment, but um, if you haven't heard of us or you don't know us, and I see a lot of our members out there, we're a national organization um, focused on environmental sustainability and business advocacy. Uh, we, we started here in San Diego as a regional chamber of commerce focused on sustainability, and about a year ago, we reached out to be a national organization. Uh, we've opened some offices across the country. We have a few more that are gonna be, you'll be hearing about very, very soon. Um, and really extending our membership in what we're doing um, all across the country. So uh, it's been a, sort of a labor of love. It's been a lot of fun, and we've met a lot of great people and seen a lot of amazing things that are coming out, um, a lot of great technologies and a lot of progress. Um, one of the things that, that I, I would have to say is it feels like now that things are conspiring for our good, for the good of the chamber and for what we're doing. And uh, I'm so thrilled um, to announce uh, a, something about Irene Stillings. Um, just recently, I don't know if you saw the press release or saw one of my, my many newsletters, but Irene Stillings has agreed to uh, come on board with the U.S. Green Chamber as our president, and I couldn't be happier. Um, Irene has an a, a amazing background. Um, if any of you have heard of the California Center for Sustainable Energy, um, she was uh, responsible for bringing that organization. When she started, they were about seven employees. I think they're about 75 now. And really a powerhouse in the state of California for solar initiatives and for sustainable, sustainability education and for so much more. And she really took an organization that was very small that nobody heard of and really created something very, very powerful. So um, to have that kind of talent 
come on board with the Green Chamber. We didn't let her retire. I think this will, w might have been her second retirement, third retirement, but we didn't let her, and, and um, she's also not that type of person. So we are, we are completely um, thrilled. Uh, she has over 20 years in, in, the, energy, um, in the energy space and uh, a lot of experience in uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, alternative transportation, you know, all of the solar initiatives and California initiatives that are, that are going on. Um, she's a board member on the National Marketing Executives Conference, Environmental Entrepreneur, San Diego Regional Sustainable Partnership, San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce Policy Committee. So um, just an incredible, incredible advocate for sustainability and for um, energy and responsibility. And so um, I couldn't I couldn't think of a better person, so I'm just really, really thrilled to have her. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce and, and bring up Irene, our new president. Oops. All over my feet. Actually, <clears throat> my friend David was being very nice. He was trying to make me younger than I am because it isn't 20 years in the energy industry. I've been in the energy business for 40 years. And uh, uh, through a, a variety of different uh, positions, and this is, uh, when I left CCSE this spring, I said I was retiring, and, uh, but, and this was the third time I said I retired, and this is the Therefore, the fourth time that I am coming back and saying, eh, I'm not ready. So I hope that you will find that what we have to say and what I can add to with David, I feel David and I are very good together and we complement each other and I hope together we can bring the Green Chamber to bigger and better things. But today I want to talk to you about energy and energy in 2020. And I have to start out by uh, asking, you know, it's 12 days until this blankety blank election is over, 12 days. It's been going on for two years. Have any of you noticed what's missing from the discussion in, in uh, this last two years? Energy, no? Well, any discussion of energy. Um, who managed to watch all four debates? Oh, it's more than I, more than I expected. Uh, the, <laughs> David and I watched the presidential debates together, moaning and groaning and uh, carrying on, but what was missing from all of this is any use of the words climate change. Nobody heard that. There was no discussion of energy efficiency, no discussion of the upcoming and ongoing green energy re uh, revolution. And yet, this morning, I don't know how many of you are KPBS junkies like I am, have it on all day long, there were three separate segments today on the local NPR station about climate change and about how uh, the, the vast majority of the population believes something is going on, and the fact that the political world is taking no notice of it. In so many venues, it's been recognized that climate change is a dangerous threat uh, to human security, and that it's mostly caused by human activity. Uh, at the Rio Plus 20 conference that was held earlier this year, uh, the deliberations there focused on green development, green energy, job creation, and sustainability. The, the lead, uh, world leaders there identified a historic, historic opportunity 
before the world to pull the world out of recession to create a more sustainable future by promoting clean technologies and practices. Rio plus 20 signatories noted uh, that humanity's been on this planet for a very long time, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, where they left, where humanity left a relatively minimal environmental impact until about 150 years ago. And 150 years ago, with the coming of the Industrial Revolution, and it seems almost unreal that in such a very short amount of time, we have endangered our own lives and impacted the Earth more than we know by shifting the total global economy to coal, oil, and gas. The signatories at Rio Plus 20 acknowledged and forcefully that we must now make the shift back to living with and off of nature and agreed that we are at a turning point in this new industrial revolution. The new green industrial revolution, however, must be led with the same fervor that got us into this mess in the first place. And the fervor that accompanied the Industrial Revolution was all the benefits to be realized from getting people off the farm and, and getting into factories and producing more goods. And there was great passion around that. And that's why I think it's time for a new revelation, I think it's up to us to do something about, because that cl clock is ticking, and the time is now. And that's why the lack of attention to energy in the current election is so very disturbing to me, and I know to a lot of you, because energy deserves far more attention. Just think about it. We all use energy. We all pay for it. We all breathe the pollution it creates. We all depend on it to be there when we need it. And if there is one issue that affects every American, every, of every age, every place, every income level, it's energy. And yet, you listen to those debates, both candidates spoke briefly, very briefly, of how they would direct a national energy policy. <laughs> Romney proposes to achieve energy independence by 2020 by producing more oil, more coal, and natural gas. And what we can't produce ourselves, we'd import from Canada and Mexico. That's his energy policy. I'm sorry, excuse me to show my leanings, but I sit there and I look and I shake my head and I say, what the hell's he been smoking? You know, <laughs> because the reality of a global economy is totally left out of, of his um, plan. The president did a little better, not much better in pointing out the new CAFE standards, which I think are, were long overdue, and the 90 billion, with a B, dollars that have been invested in technology tax incentives, loan guarantees, government grants, uh, through the 2009 uh, stimulus program. But he admits, he admits and he used th this word, that his energy policy is a hodgepodge, and that it is. And many of us in this room have been deploring for 20 years why we don't have a national energy policy, where I, among very few in the entire globe who don't have a centrally 
our directed energy policy. So we're so long overdue. Uh, but even worse, through a, a long, oh, a very long presidential election season, neither ha campaign has paid much or any attention to our fastest, cheapest, cleanest source of new energy supply, and that's energy efficiency, and, which is a term that encompasses all the way we, ways we can get more work out of less energy. Energy efficiency has been around for a long time. The state of California has been deeply invested in energy efficiency since 1970. And as a result, and this is maybe a statistic some of you haven't heard about, the state of California has the lowest per capita use of electricity of any state in the country. Energy demand's going like that. In California, it's going like that. And that is because of the state. And um, <clears throat> the, but renewed call is coming for some new initiatives. And a new study called the $20 billion Bonanza, which was produced by the Southwest Energy Efficiency uh, Project uh, very recently, concluded that for every dollar invested in energy efficiency programs, at least $2 in savings result for business and residential customers. How do we get that message? How do we get the message out? Because most people don't believe that, and, and that isn't their experience. And according to the American Council uh, for an Energy Efficient Economy, commonly called ACEEE, we waste 86% of the energy that we burn in the US, which to me appears to be an unsustainable lack of, of uh, uh, productivity. And inefficiency means wasted money, for every energy consumer, inefficiency produces pollution, and it makes our companies and manufacturing less productive and less competitive. Improve us, improvements in energy efficiency would be a, an economic stimulus that keeps on stimulating. And even though there's been a lot of criticism of the stimulus package that came out of Washington in 2009, in the energy area, it's been very effective. We just need more of it. Family schools, businesses, government operations, all would enjoy the equivalent of uh, new free, uh, tax-free disposable incomes that would otherwise be spent on their energy bills. Um, energy waste costs jobs. ACEEE estimates that continued energy efficiency could cost the US economy as many as 15 million jobs in the coming decades. That's staggering. And I believe that the most promising jobs in the 21st century for you young people out there still starting out, the most promising jobs will come with the green economy. The green revolution is opening up, opening up a, a world of opportunities, a binder full of jobs <laughs> in, in fields like clean energy technology, water infrastructure, green buildings, agriculture, administration, manufacturing, training, education, forestry, protecting ecosystems, transportation, and minimizing or avoiding all forms of waste and pollution. And there are such creative things going on, like, uh, a member of, of the board of directors at uh, CCSE, where I worked for so long, has come up with a process of creating um, 
the furniture out of cow poop, <laughs> cow manure, which is full of fiber. Think about it. <laughs> the cows eat the grass. <laughs> they, they get rid of the grass. They, and, the, and what they get rid of is full of fiber. And this gentleman has found a way to remove all the, the liquids and to use that fiber to build furniture. You should see some of the beautiful stuff he's creating. Now, is that a job that was uh, available uh, before we recognized how uh, scarce resources are becoming? No. It's part of the Green Revolution. And I think these opportunities are endless and only as limited as our imaginations. Because you think of these things, I once, the customer doesn't really know what they want. They really don't know what they want. If you went in 17th century, uh, <clears throat> times and asked the farmer what he needed, he would have told you a stronger horse. He wouldn't have told you that he needed a tractor. It's people like you, it's people that work in, in creative uh, jobs that see problems and find solutions that make our lives better and more efficient. Energy waste, cost jobs. I believe that healthy jobs that pay well and can't be outsourced. Most green jobs cannot be outsourced. They need to be here. So, which is a green revolution opening up a world of opportunities. People who land jobs in these areas have the best chance of thriving in future decades and many green jobs tap into one of the most powerful equations for escaping poverty. They don't require a high level of education, but they pay good wages. And that's, these are the type of jobs we need to find to replace the manufacturing uh, jobs that are being lost. This is why uh, ignoring energy efficiency and the gains such technologies can bring is so very scary. What do we do about this? Well, to start, make sure you vote. Make sure that the people that are around you vote. That is the way we can make ourselves heard and create those binders of, of green jobs. I think when we get into our panel discussion, I'd like to talk more about some other things we need to do as part of the green revolution of moving us forward, uh, re relating to behavior change, to uh, the uh, new ways to fund solar power, and the grid impacts that are facing us in 2020 because of the uh, great increase in um, renewable energy, which is mandated by the state to have 33% of a utility's uh, portfolio come from green energy. Well, it sounds easy, but it isn't. So I would like to give my uh, fellow speakers an opportunity to add their pitch to this. But please remember that we do have the power. We have the power to change what's going on in our world. We have the power to do it by voting. We have the power to do it by taking action ourselves. And I, um, I like the group that I see here. I think that you all have great power and you will uh, do something.
And here to tell you more about what we should do is my friend Peter Hamilton. Peter worked for me for several years at uh, CCSE, recently left uh, CSE to um, uh, take a job with uh, NRG. He is a uh, Grew up in my neck of the woods. I'm a New Yorker, born and bred. And Peter grew up in Ithaca, New York, which was about 25 miles from where I lived, though we didn't know each other then. So um, that makes him a good guy anyway. And he has his MBA from Cornell University, where one of my children graduated too. So I'm pleased to welcome Peter and not waste any of his times with a long um, introduction. Peter? Thanks, Irene. Um, so it's always hard to figure out uh, what level to, to talk to about this stuff. Energy uh, in 2020 is a pretty big topic. Uh, so I'm going to try and avoid uh, the, the very, very ridiculously high level and also avoid getting down into the, into the weeds of, say, California energy policy, which I would be really more than happy to do, uh, but probably after this. Um, if there's any, anybody who has particular interests, I know there's a Q&A session after, after this, but if you do hear something you want to hear more about, feel free to flag me down. Uh, it plans to be a, a really informal, a lot of give and take is, is, is expected. So. Um, okay, so I, I'm t I'll, I'll start where, where Irene left off. She gave us a little bit of an inspirational message at the end. I, I would agree, as, as challenging it is, as it is to sit through the political debates and, and hear, this is it's always challenging every election year to, to see the level of debate about energy policy, um, and this year's no exception. But it's important to remember uh, how far we've come. I know when I started my career out of college in, uh, I graduated in 1997, and I was working at a Lockheed Martin facility, the same one that Irene's husband was worked at as well, interestingly enough. Um, and I was working on hybrid vehicle drivetrains, hybrid electric vehicle drivetrains. And nobody knew what a hybrid electric vehicle was. Uh, moreover, gas was so cheap that nobody cared. Uh, we were in the middle of our SUV craze where every year the cars were getting bigger and bigger. Fuel economy of our fleet was getting lower and lower. Uh, nobody talked about green anything. Sustainability wasn't on the radar. Climate change was a kooky idea that some people cared about but most people didn't even know about. So we have come a really long way and that's been that's been the impact, collective impact of the career, the work, the life of individuals. It hasn't been something magical. It's been people making decisions and, and, and working hard. So it's important to remember that. So, okay, I'm gonna delve just for a split second back at to, the, to the stratospheric level because I re mentioned something about the, the Industrial Revolution. Um, I remember um, early on in my, my marriage, my wife is a biologist, and I was, I was reading an article about uh, global population. And if you've seen a, a, a graph of global population over, say, 100,000 years, you know, it's flat, 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 flat. The Industrial Revolution hits and it just spikes. And I, I said, you know, Gwen, have you ever seen anything like this? This is absolutely crazy. She says, that, that, that's, if you plot the bacterial colony growth in a Petri dish, it looks exactly the same. You know, it's, it's a logarithmic, just spikes. And then, of course, what happens after that is they all drown in their own feces. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we can avoid that and we're smarter than bacteria. Um, that's right, right. Um, yes, we can use the bacteria's energy, exactly. Turns out feces have energy. Um, or you can make them into furniture. It's a, we've got two answers already and we haven't even started yet. Um, so, but it's important to remember the flip side of that, though. You, the, the population went from, say, a, a billion people or even less than that to seven billion. Uh, that's, a, that's a tremendous uh, achievement that we now have so many people who are able to enjoy living. And I would argue that 
uh, energy really underpin that. It is the, the kind of the auger in that petri dish that allowed that explosion to happen. So the idea that we're gonna, we're gonna as, a, as a society, um, we, should, we should go back, it's just not an option. We, we can't go back. There are only two things that we can do. We need to first decouple the link that's historically existed between energy use and gross domestic product. And the second thing we need to do is we need to decarbonize the energy that we use. So if we can do those two things, then we can continue uh, to thrive uh, without poisoning ourselves. So when, when you ask what does the energy world look like in 2020 or 2050 or 2100, uh, the answer, of course, is, it, well, it depends. Um, but one thing I know is that it's really important to understand what the system works like works right now, how it looks like, uh, how it looks, what the constraints are. You don't go trying to reinvent the automobile if you don't understand metallurgy. You've got to understand the basics of how energy works. This is, reflects my training as an engineer. Uh, I believe you need to sort of get back to first principles before you start discussing radically reorganizing something. So I'll talk briefly uh, about what those constraints are. So essentially, the way our energy system works right now is we have three main sources of fuel. We use coal and natural gas to generate electricity, and we use oil to move stuff around. Uh, oil, liquid fuel, we turn it into jet fuel and gasoline and diesel fuel. That, that provides our transportation, our mobility. Uh, essentially, coal and natural gas provide our electricity. Um, and that's basically the picture. Um, on the electric side of things, uh, coal and natural gas dominate. There's some nuclear as well. Um, the way the system was worked was, was designed from scratch starting 100, 100 years ago when uh, Edison and Tesla were arguing over whether, whether there should be an alternating current or a direct current grid. The, the way that debate was settled was on an on a industry standard of building very large power plants in relatively remote areas and piping that power out to a series of loads. That's been the way the system has built, been built out for the 150 years. Uh, and those power plants work very well on coal and natural gas. Um, so that it, it, we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars of sunk cost in infrastructure worldwide. So the idea that by 2020, which is only seven years from now, that basic picture is gonna be radically changed is I would say a, a little bit uh, unlikely. Um, I hope that's not me, is it? No. Um, Purse up there. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Um, okay. Do we have a jar you have to put five dollars in or something? Um, so, the idea that that system is going to be radically reinvented in, in eight years is 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 unlikely. It's it's not going to happen. Uh, you're going to have to use the infrastructure that we've built and 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 tinker around the edges, and hopefully in in emerging areas, in emerging economies where they're building this stuff from scratch. Uh, a new standard will emerge quickly. I've done a fair bit of work internationally. Um, and the, uh, the most striking thing, if you look at our energy picture from a global perspective, is that energy growth in the OECD has pretty much flatlined. So as has economic growth. But uh, if you do have economic growth, two, three, four percent per year, it's, that's quite healthy. The emerging markets are growing much faster than that and energy consumption is also growing much faster than that. IEA predicts that by 2035, global energy consumption, that includes transportation and electricity, is gonna be up by 40% from where it is now. 40%, I mean, that's a staggering amount. If you think that's, that's you know, you think about adding a United States plus Germany uh, over the next 40 years or so, uh, or, or 15, 20 years or so, and, and you get the scale of, of the kind of growth that's happening over there. So finding a way to change the, uh, change the trajectory and, and invent a new standard for uh, electricity generation is, is really important. So um, the challenges that we have here are increasing global 
demand. Um, it's very difficult to come up with the supply to meet that demand. And of course, economics teaches us that if you have a mismatch between supply and demand, uh, what you have is price volatility. Price volatility is an absolute killer. It doesn't help anybody to have spikes in, in gas prices or oil prices, coal prices. Uh, oil is the one that we notice the most because it's a global commodity uh, and, and it's incredibly volatile. Um, but price spikes hurt producers and consumers. They hurt everybody. High energy prices are essentially a tax on our entire economy. Nobody likes taxes on our entire economy, especially when the revenues can't be used to fund, uh, fund uh, progressive or uh, socially beneficial programs. Uh, I don't understand why this isn't a bipartisan issue. Uh, it's, it's really frustrating. But um, meeting global supply is a real challenge. It's going to continue to be a real challenge. So. Uh, I'm going to take a couple more minutes and talk about what I think the opportunities are. So this tremendous challenge, we've got essentially the entire global energy infrastructure which is going to be adding on to itself over the next uh, 20, 25 years to the tune of 40%. By the way, the infrastructure that we've built over the last 100 years is very old, so a lot of that's going to have to get rebuilt as well. So we're, again, we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars of capital cost, tri trillions of dollars even of, of operating cost as well in terms of fuel costs and O&M. So, so if you're looking for a big industry, this is the biggest industry. Um, and, it's, and if we're going to look to remake it, I would argue um, we're going to see we're going to see some significant continued changes on the supply side. So uh, instead of coal, natural gas uh, and, and oil, now we're talking about a lot of, of other alternatives, of course, solar, wind. Uh, the difference is that solar and wind are intermittent. Uh, you can't predict that they'll be on the way you can predict that a coal-fired power plant will be on. Uh, and, and I know my friend from Shell will talk a little bit more about how that impacts our power grid. Um, so re, uh, so when, we, when we do this switch to uh, intermittent renewables, it's going to require a different way of consuming energy. It's going to require a different way of paying for energy. So all of these structures that have been built up over the last hundred years around this central station power plant model are going to have to be rethought. This is happening in California today. We're talking about, okay, what should the business model of a utility be? Uh, Forty years ago, we decided, well, look, if we want to make, be serious about energy efficiency in the state of California, we can't reward the utilities for every kilowatt hour of energy that they sell because they, they're not going to try and put themselves out of business by succeeding at energy efficiency. A lot of people don't know this, but in California, we purposefully decoupled uh, utilities, investor-owned utilities, profits from the sale of energy. So, in fact, sdg e does not make more money if they sell more power. They make the same amount of power of the same amount of money. And in fact, if they can encourage their customers to adopt energy efficiency and, and energy conservation me measures, they are rewarded by authorizing a slightly higher rate of return. So we have, uh, through policy mechanism, changed the economic incentive of, of a utility. That was great innovative thinking 40 years ago. We're going to need a lot more of that to figure out how do we deal with intermittent renewable energy? How do we compensate somebody for putting a solar power a power plant on their roof? Uh, how do we compensate them for them putting a battery? Uh, how do we charge them for an electric vehicle if the electric vehicle can maybe not only pull power from the grid but also push it back out to the grid when the grid needs it most? These are all structure, structural questions that need to be answered if we're going to make this transition. And they're all very difficult. And because we have all this built out infrastructure, uh, there are a lot of people who have vested interests in the answer going one way or another. So it ends up being a very interesting soup uh, to, and a very interesting play, playground to play in if you're, if you're looking for some, some meaty policy questions. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Should I move right up to the uh, to post? Great.
Thank you both. Really, that's super informative. Um, so what we're going to do now uh, for just a few minutes is kind of open it up for questions that may have come up um, for anyone, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, I, I would, um, Peter, could you hold one second? I'd like to uh, give the opportunity to uh, <clears throat> Mike Evans uh, from uh, Shell to come up and, and talk a little bit uh, since he's specifically about the year 2020, when the utilities have to meet 33% uh, of their uh, load from renewables. And he has an interesting take on that. Well, thanks, Irene. Um, so, Pete, that was really interesting, just a great kind of view of, of uh, what's going on really around the world, too. And, um, I really like the um, discussion about George, Westing, um, George Westinghouse and Thomas Edison. And um, you know, back uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, Thomas Edison was really hooked on DC transmission. And so he went to the state, New York State Department of Corrections and he said, you know, you need to use AC current in the electric chair because it's so dangerous. And he's trying to undermine George, uh, George Westinghouse. And uh, he actually got them to use AC current for the electric chair, <laughs> trying to prove that it was too dangerous and try to get people to not use it. And uh, it was kind of an, an underhanded way to try to get his DC current across, but it, DC just didn't work out. So, uh, so my name is Mike Evans. I'm, I work for Shell Energy now. I've been in the business for about um, 31 years. And, um, and at that time, 31 years ago, um, I was kind of sitting in your spot. Um, I was getting my degree in mechanical engineering at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I got to say that working in the energy business has just been a blast. I've had a chance to work at solar turbines here in, here in town. Um, Scythe Energy is developing independent power plants um, across the United States. Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric for a few years working on uh, both South Bay Power Plant and the development of the California and ISO uh, power, exchange, uh, power Exchange, the California ISO. And, the uh, independent market that we opened up in 1998, um, and then to move over to Shell Energy, um, whose uh, goal really is to look at supply of, uh, of clean generation. Um, we have an, an environmental products group. Um, we have a, a Shell Wind um, group. We manage about 100, we generate about 100 megawatts of wind up in the um, Palm Springs area as well. So, um, how many people are students? I'm just curious. Just a hand, just kind of see where uh, the, the audience breaks out. Okay. Well, great. Um, I, uh, I also serve on the uh, WEC TEPSI committee, so we put together a 10-year and 20-year plan for the Western United States for transmission. Um, and then I also serve um, as chair of the San Diego Chamber of Commerce, Energy, and Water Committee, and so kind of try to stay involved in some things that are going on. Mike, um, would you tell them what WEC means? Oh, thank you, Irene. So um, the United States is divided up into um, electric re reliability regions. And so the largest is um, the WECC, or the Western um, Electric Coordination Coordinating Council. And they set up standards to ensure the reliable <laughs> supply of electricity in the West. We have really the most balancing authorities in our um, region, about 39 balancing authorities. And then they all generate um, electricity, and they stay in balance. Um, they meet their... Um, uh, load and their supply in uh, real time. So every every four seconds, they got telemetry signals going out, and then they have obligations for inadvertent exchange between the balancing authorities. They have to make the difference. So this is the dynamic that's going on that nobody ever really sees. But you have operators in every one of these balancing authorities looking at um, control performance standards, and and they're looking at graphs of showing where the energy is going to. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in integrating renewables is make sure that that exchange of energy and that balance always stays in balance. And as we look at um, 2020 and um, a renewable portfolio standard of about 33% in the state of California, you're looking at a substantial amount of energy coming from what's called intermittent resources, resources you can't really depend on. Um, we take it as it comes, and then we have other generation that backfills when it doesn't um, supply. And so we might have a cloud go over um, a solar photovoltaic facility, and we have to have reserves somewhere to make up that difference. And so um, we're looking at uh, what is the best configuration for that in a 2020 scenario. Um, should we have a lot of fossil generation? Should we have pump storage? So I think some of the things that you can be thinking about going forward, you know, um, we want to be thinking 2020, we want to be thinking 2050, we want to think sustainable, um, low emissions, um, low carbon footprint. 
Um, so what, what are those technologies? Flywheels, um, maybe uh, battery storage. Battery storage, though, when you're making the battery, has a fairly large uh, carbon footprint. So you want to take these things into account. Um, so as a, as a cloud goes over the facility, you have to have spinning reserves available online. Probably your quickest and um, lowest carbon footprint spinning reserves are hydro facilities. Um, so there's a 600 megawatt hydro facility that's been proposed. It's under development right now, um, just north of here up at Lake Elsinore. Um, it's got about uh, 900 feet of, of elevation, so a very logical resource. It's just not economic right now. And so when Irene talks about a, a national policy, we, we need to talk about how we make these things economic and um, what the proper drivers are for these. Um, so the, the, the real thing that we're looking at in 2020 is that we have a traditional um, uh, uh, peak period right now. Maybe you're kind of familiar with things that you used to get in literature and your utility bill. Or, but basically from about noon until 6 o'clock, we use a lot of electricity. Um, we use it for air conditioning loads or uh, manufacturing people at work. Um, and that's the typical traditional peak period. But as we bring on um, resources such as solar that operates between 7 a.m. and about uh, 4 p.m. or so, um, it starts dropping off. Um, it changes the mix of how we deliver energy into the grid. And so those power plants that are coming on don't have to run as much during the, during the afternoon uh, period. And then we have wind that comes on. The wind comes on about 1 in the afternoon or so, and it runs until about 2, 2 a.m. or so in the morning. It's kind of a function of heating up the desert. All the air blows out to the desert as, a, as, the, as the heat rises, and uh, this is kind of the, the regular pattern for wind. It comes, up, it comes in a little bit sooner, a little bit later, and so you have some discrepancies that you have to have spinning reserves or operating capacity online for. Um, and so as you see um, the influx of new renewables, you're going to see a big change in how um, we operate fossil plants. And so you're going to see in the morning from about 5 till 7 a big ramp up of load. Everybody's waking up, they're turning on everything, and you got a lot of, uh, a lot of load. So maybe 8,000 megawatts. So what's that work out to? Maybe, you know, like uh, 16 Palomar Energy Facilities up here in Escondido. It's a lot of generation to ramp up at one point in time. And then when the solar comes on, you're going to see all that ramp back down again. So you're going to have a kind of a short peak in the morning, and you have another peak from about 3 p.m. until about 7 p.m. when um, your solar starts to come off, and then people come home or, you know, they start turning on lights and, and you have load come up. And so the ISO has identified this as a critical problem in the grid. And so in the 2020 time frame, we're looking at that technology that needs flexible capacity. So we have to have extra reserves, the flywheels, the, the pump storage on the grid. So kind of a future scenario is going to be, what are, those, what are those technologies and how can we get them implemented? So it's just, you know, as you're thinking ahead and thinking about your career, what to do. I'd say that you're going to have about 90% of your supply mix coming from those type of resources. And then the other area that we have that we can really take advantage of is kind of a demand response product. Um, in other words, how do we get people to change their behavior a little bit and not use um, as much electricity during those peak periods of time um, when, we're at, when we're stressing the grid? So we want to look at price signals or ways to indicate to people um, that they could curtail some load and really save um, a lot of money. So we want to have a, a price feedback to people, and then we also want to have maybe um, appliances that have automatic controls in them. So they're getting a signal maybe from the Internet, uh, maybe from your smart meter that says, hey, let's just shut off this component for now. So um, those are some things that I think are really affecting us. So um, I think with the theme of what we're talking about tonight as far as opportunities in the green um, industrial revolution, uh, we kind of want to think about some supply options and also some behavioral things that would help to um, continue to reduce our carbon footprint. So is that kind of... Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. So we have just a couple minutes, maybe 10 minutes max, if anyone has any questions. Well, um, it's, a, it's a good question. I remember um, a few years ago, uh, some, some snarky uh, energy economist did a, did, a, did a comparison and found out that, you remember the um, 
Second Life, that uh, virtual, virtual game. It's a computer game, I guess. It's all based online. Those online servers that serve that game use a lot of power. Some, somebody figured out that the average resident of Brazil used less power than the average uh, virtual person in Second Life. Um, so, so the answer, <laughs> the answer is that, uh, that, that the developing world has a long way to go uh, before they come close to the United States in per capita energy consumption. Uh, U.S. is, I think, number two now after Australia. Um, but we're way, way higher than China. I mean, they, they just passed us in terms of total energy consumption, and they have four times the population. So uh, there's the 25%. Um, now, the scary part of that to me is that means they have got a lot of headroom, right? It, it, you don't see energy consumption in the U.S. growing very much. Um, but you could see in China, you could see it doubling pretty easily, right, if there isn't a major, major change. And Africa is even farther behind. It really, it just, it just tracks with economic growth. So that's why I think the opportunity in, in emerging markets is, uh, is more pressing than it is here in the United States. Now, of course, that's really thrown a, a wrench in the whole climate change debate because the question then is, was India says, well, you got to pollute the earth for 150 years getting to your current standard of living. Why are you now telling me that I can't do the same? I've got lots of coal reserves, so does China. Uh, so it's a real challenging ethical, moral dil dilemma of how to figure this out. Um, and, and I think the only answer, the answer has to be, uh, we've got to find a way that you can enjoy the kind of prosperity or greater prosperity that we enjoy in the United States, but without the carbon footprint. You can't say you can't burn, use, use that energy. You've got to be, say you can use a different kind of energy that, by the way, has all these other advantages. Peter? No, back, right there. Um, thank you. Peter Meissen. I'm with the Global Energy Network Institute. Wanted to tie together a little bit of, of Char Charles Keeling's curve, of what you said about the IEA. Uh, most of you, I think, would know Charles Keeling. Her curve here, the CO2 tracking for the last 50 years, and we're, I think, at 393 ppm right now, going toward what I'm told is 450 by the smartest guys I've followed. Uh, the IEA said if we don't turn the corner on CO2 in five years, so by 2018, soon, that we suffer dire consequences of climate change consequences, and I think all of us have seen what that might look like in this last year, only worse. So how do you, we, square off turning the corner in five years when the growth is going to increase 40 percent in the next 20 or 30. Irene, do you want me to take a crack at that? Or? <laughs> be my guest. No, no, you. Uh, um, I, I mean, so, and I should just be clear, I'm speaking as Pete Hamilton here, not, not as NRG or, or anybody else. Um, I, I think there's no question that we are going to face dire consequences. Um, uh, I, I, I have been for the last 15 years hearing that uh, you know, we only have this many years left. We only have this many years left unless we turn the corner. I, I mean, the, the number you often hear is 80% is below 1990 levels. Um, well, guess what? You know, we're not going like that. We're going like that. So we haven't even flattened out. We've flattened out in the, in the developed country, but that's because we've got a recession and because our growth is almost flat. The emerging markets are still going like that. So we're not even close. Now, the, 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 uh, my guess is that maybe that's, maybe that's what it takes is those kinds of dire consequences. I mean, it's, you, you have to be thinking seriously about, about adaptation as well as mitigation at this point. That's my that, opinion. That's what I was going to say, too. I think, uh, again, talking about opportunities for the young people entering the market, it's not just a matter of uh, mitigation and reducing emissions, uh, we need to seriously get involved in how we are adapting and going to adapt to the new climate that's coming our way. And I think that will offer a lot of opportunities also. 
you're actually seeing that at the local government level. It's really, it's kind of interesting. Um, local governments are, are m much less partisan uh, and, and they care about keeping the lights on, keeping water supplies going, you know, th things like that. And you look, local governments are responsible for planning out their infrastructure over a 50 year time horizon. And they're looking at this, you know, San Diego, all around the coast of California is all looking at, at, uh, at how do we cope with sea level rise from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, it's a completely different uh, perspective, but it shows you the seriousness of what we're facing. There's actually a conference on that this, uh, this week, right? Doug? Group here in San Diego. Oh, there's a. I'm Doug Hansen. There's a group here called Citizens Climate Lobby. Just as an FYI, and if you don't know about it, I, I would recommend that you find out about it because it's fantastic. Citizens Climate Lobby, and you can Google it. But where I'm going with that is, so I'm very keenly aware of, of climate change. Been around a lot of the scientists at Scripps Institute, and so I know about the the Keeling curve being a real issue, and it gets ignored a lot. And especially in context of the energy discussion, what I notice is that it's, I always visualize our civilization now and us as playing chess. And the chess is the world and, and physics and things moving in one direction and us as humans with our unlimited wants meeting very constrained supplies as that's the chess game. And we keep moving pieces like creating more coal-fired power plants and talking nonsense like clean coal uh, when you want to ignore climate change. So where I'm going with this as a question is, I've looked at nuclear uh, with some rigor, and it, especially after Fukushima, it's so emotional, so negative, everyone's turned off to it. Yet from, from my perspective as a sustainability addict, I can't see that nuclear can be omitted. I think that without nuclear, we're basically host. But, so I'll pose that as a question. Would you talk about nuclear and any pros and cons that you see? As a <clears throat> lifelong greenie, I'm uh, actually, and I lived, oh, maybe 50 miles from Three Mile Island when it had, on the East Coast in 79, when it had its uh, problem. <laughs> uh, nuclear scares me, really scares me. But trying to be rational, I think if, if we can find a way of what we do with the um, used rods and find some avenue rather than leaving all those used rods on the site of every nuclear power plant. And in here in California, that's earthquake area. And, and yet you have this large mass of radioactive material that it's probably not properly protected. I don't know for sure, but it frightens me. But I don't see, I agree with you, I don't see any answer coming forward because given what Mike's talking about with the, the, the problems with total renewable, we're just not gonna be able to do that. So where do we go? I don't have an answer to the question, but uh, my, this anti-nuke uh, soul here is beginning to waver in my objections to it. I would just add that one, uh, the, the, the way that conventional nuclear power plants work today uh, is, is not, doesn't play very nicely with uh, high penetrations of intermittent renewables, um, mm -hmm. the way the mic. So when, when he was talking about these ramping and you've got you've to ramp things up and down, nuclear power plants don't ramp. Nuclear power plants you know, sit at their rated capacity and they crank it out day and night and day and night and day and night. Uh, that's the way that's the way they run. They're not designed to be moved up and down. So um, it, that's another considerate a thing to consider. I understand it. You know, they are incredibly uh, appealing as a source of very reliable, uh, theoretically cheap 
uh, low carbon fuel, um, no carbon fuel. Uh, you know, you see they shut down San Onofre. That's gonna that's gonna really hurt the state's carbon footprint. Uh, that's a that's a 2.2 2, uh, 2, 2,200 megawatt plant. 2,200 megawatts. The peak load of SDG is 4,800 megawatts. So that plant just by itself can cover half of San Diego. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of power that thing generates and no carbon. Um, but it's not a flexible resource. So it comes back to this idea of, of how, how's this system gonna look? You know, if we're gonna have a lot of intermittent renewables, then it's gonna be very hard to incorporate nuclear unless you have massive amounts of storage. So that's another question. I, I think what we're gonna do now is, um, in a minute, we're gonna have a, a little raffle, but we're going to um, go to our break and we have some food and refreshments and, and, and we'll still be here to answer questions. So if you have a question, just come up and, and, and talk with us. Um, and then just uh, one or two quick announcements. Um, I can, have- Can I just say one yeah. thing, one thing? This lovely lady over here with the red hair and the bright <laughs> yellow jack, love it, um, is Crystal Crawford. And she's here representing a, a vendor called Y Green, who has developed and is about to launch a program that takes the upfront cost out of installing solar. Uh, for commercial businesses. And in the solar industry, which we've been very involved in, both Peter and I, the uh, residential market's going crazy, but the commercial market, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses, has really been slow because of uh, the, the generally the upfront cost. And Crystal can tell you all about how uh, Y Green can help you uh, if you have a small business get the uh, energy savings that accrue from putting solar on your roof without paying any money for it. Sounds too good to be true, but it is true. Thank you, Irene. So I wanted to say um, we'll be available to uh, answer any questions and then just a couple of uh, quick announcements. Um, I. Most of the, a lot of you here I know because you're already members with the Green Chamber. We're growing. I think we're about 500 or so companies in San Diego County. But if you're um, a business and you're not a part of the Green Chamber, um, come up and see me. I have a special for um, enrolling. It's super inexpensive and we'd love to have you on board and be a part of what we're doing and what we're creating. Um, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, 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 is we don't work without our um, incredible volunteers. So I have Arena and Courtney and Adam here today and um, they are super dedicated and they work incredibly hard to, uh, to make everything happen for the Green Chamber. So I'm just really thankful for them and I always want to say that. And, um, and then we had Stone Steps Music here today. How great were they? And they're going to they're gonna play again for us. <laughs> And then uh, the, the last couple things, um, we have some tireless um, board members. Uh, Sarah Hardwick is here from uh, Zenzi Communications. And not only is she on our board and, and helps us out, but they actually represent us. So if you see us in the news or media or anywhere, um, Zenzi's had their hand in it, and they've really been a big help for us. And Sarah's here. And then Peter Zahn is here, and Peter's our chairman. He's the one who actually got the idea of uh, starting this Green Chamber. And he, he, likes, to, he likes to get started and, and do a bunch of things. He's decided that he had so much free time, he's decided to run for city council <laughs> in Solana Beach. Um, but he's, um, he's one of the smartest and one of the nicest and one of the most thoughtful people I know. So if you're in Solana Beach or you know somebody in Solana Beach, he's going to be a great addition to the city council there. So... Um, and I just definitely want to uh, thank UCSD. I want to do a bunch more with UCSD in the, in the coming year. And with that, I'll, I'll bring Catrice up. I think for, for time's sake, we'll announce it, and then you could like raise your hand but not come up, and then afterwards, come up and get your prize, okay? <laughs> and that way we'll be quicker to the food and refreshments, all right? Thank you all so much. Thank you, and thanks for everybody for uh, hanging around with us. So we have 
five raffle prizes, and so we're going to announce those. Our first is for, actually we have two separate raffles for each two reusable bags. Branded UC San Diego, because we really believe it on campus. So, uh, David, the names for these first Peter two. Meisen. Peter Meisen wins the first. Uh, second set, green and yellow. Uh, Dan Knorr, InfoCap, okay, thank you. <laughs> Our next prize is a reusable water bottle. Thank you guys for coming. Tatiana Young, <laughs> so call for that. Uh, our next prize is actually courtesy of the U.S. Green Chamber. It's a free one year, membership. one year membership to the Green Chamber. This is Tracy Hanak by Trace Productions. Okay. And our last most wonderful prize, $50 gift card to the UCSD bookstore on campus here. And this is Stephen Markowitz, Hidden Valley Retreat and Spa. <laughs> so thank you everyone for uh, participating in our raffle. And uh, just as uh, David has mentioned, the next event of our two event series will be here on campus in our new structural and material engineering building. You'll receive announcements and uh, materials for that event and speaker information and everything, but it's here on campus. It's a wonderful building with a great indoor outdoor space and it houses our innovative departments of nano engineering, structural engineering, and the visual arts. So we look forward to welcoming you back to campus again next month. And please stay around and enjoy the bounty of refreshments and uh, conversation with our speakers and our other panelists. Thank you.